morning for uh, actually introducing us to pollution abatement strategies and technologies. And so I'd like to introduce you to Jim Wagner. He is the Air Pollution Control Officer of Butte County Air Quality Management District. And our second speaker is Kevin Cochran. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Green Tracks out of Marysville, California. And so I do want to thank you both for presenting today. And if you'll give me just a moment, we're going to go ahead and turn the slide deck over to, um, let's see, over to Jim Wagner of the Butte County Air Quality Management District. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I'm probably showing up here as Angel, but this is really uh, Jim Wagoner that's speaking now. So uh, the focus I'm going to be having this morning is talking about uh, air pollution uh, control. And um, But first I wanted to get into some background information for folks. Um, you know, historically, uh, we, we haven't, you know, folks haven't worried too much about air pollution because it was something that was something that we just had to live with, we felt. But uh, starting in the, certainly in the 1940s with the 1948 um, Pennsylvania and Denora uh, smog episode, you actually had a situation where um, you had um, a temperature inversion and because of some industrial activities, there was a zinc processing and steel manufacturing facilities. You had a buildup of pollution, which, which actually uh, made thousands of people ill and resulted in, in uh, at least 20 deaths. And then um, also in the 1950s, there was the so-called killer fog in London, which um, resulted in reported thousands of deaths during the area. Now, of course, people were compromised anyway because of various uh, respiratory problems, but when these pollution episodes occur, it makes it even worse. And then certainly uh, coming over to uh, the West Coast you know, here in California, and, and that's where we're reporting from uh, today is California, we've had the LA, the LA uh, smog, and smog being a combination of smoke and fog. And uh, that really led to uh, the development of the uh, clean air programs that we currently have. And so this next slide, I, I call it traditional types of air pollution. Um, the analysis that was done early on uh, identified different types of pollutants. Because when you're talking about air pollution, you're not just talking about smog as, as one type of pollution. It's really, a, it can be a combination of different things. And so we talk about particulate matter, uh, and we talk in terms of the size of the particles, uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10. And the 2.5 and 10 refer to the size of the particles. Those are microns, and I'll talk a little bit later about how, how big those are. Uh, you can see with this slide, it talks about the different types of, of, of health concerns you can have with exposure uh, long-term as well as short-term to uh, particulate matter. Uh, the, the main thing here is if, if you have a pre-existing uh, cardiovascular uh, problem, uh, exposure to high levels of particulates can make it considerably worse and, and result in mortality. And then moving down, we see um, ozone and uh, sulfur uh, dioxide having similar effects, similar respiratory effects, uh, such as uh, coughing and chest, chest tightness. And again, uh, particularly compromising people with pre-existing respiratory conditions. And then uh, continuing on carbon monoxide uh, or CO, uh, we have problems with what with folks can have uh, uh, chest pains if you have pre-existing um, issues and so forth. And then continuing down nitrogen dioxide, um, lead, you know, we've all heard about lead and, and the problems with that, neurological and cardiovascular effects, but mainly neurological effects with children. And, uh, and then more recently, uh, dealing with hazardous air pollutants, and that's been mainly uh, since the 1990 uh, Clean Air Act amendments. And, and the main concern with hazardous air pollutants are, is cancer. So, you know, we're talking about health, direct health effects due to exposure to air pollution. But now, you know, in recent years, we've been thinking more in terms of, of what can different types of pollution do to the, to the climate. And so we have the so-called climate chain pollutants or greenhouse gases. 
And so the main, the main one that we look at is carbon dioxide, and that's coming from the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, and then we have um, methane, which, um, which uh, can come from um, uh, landfills and agricultural operations, and then um, so forth down the line. These all have various, what are they called um, um, warming potentials uh, with the, the compounds down below having a more severe uh, global warming potential than carbon dioxide. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about ozone. Uh, as far as how it forms, because it's one of the main pollutants that we hear about. It's really a secondary pollutant, and it uh, forms due to reaction of uh, oxides of, of nitrogen and volatile organics in heat and, and sunlight. It's a reaction that happens in the atmosphere. It's a secondary pollutant, um, and so when we look at how to, how to deal with ozone, really we look at how to deal with the primary pollutants, in this case, oxides of nitrogen and volatile organics. Um, we have a slide here on the, a, a section on the, on the right of that slide that talks about ozone transport. And in California, that's a major issue. Uh, when you think about it, if you have emissions uh, coming from different sources, and primarily the oxides of nitrogen is from automobiles, uh, the reaction occurs, and if you have wind blowing, it actually can blow the the ozone over into other areas. And so what we see in California, certainly the South Coast and San Joaquin Valley have, have uh, problems, but actually we have pretty high ozone occurring in the, the Sierra Nevada foothills where you don't really have that many people or sources of pollution. And then um, as far as the PM 2.5, uh, the particulates, uh, the micron is 70 microns is about the average diameter of a human hair. And so when you're talking about PM 2.5, it's the really small stuff. And it's not just particles. It can also be aerosol, like droplets. And so it's not just a, a, a thing, a particle, but it can be uh, an aerosol that contains other things that as you breathe it in, it goes in and can do bad things. Uh, the main source of PM2.5 is combustion sources such as vehicles and um, uh, power generation, but also wood burning um, and wildfires can be significant sources as well. So quickly, uh, just here shows some of the major milestones in air pollution control. You know, once we, we identified we had some, uh, we had a problem we had to solve, you see that the first um, real concerted effort was in Los Angeles uh, in, 19, in the late 1940s, and then it continues on down. The first Clean Air Act uh, in 1963 uh, was adopted. Uh, the California Air Resources Board was established in 67. We had the, a significant amendment to the Clean Air Act in 1970. I don't have it on here, but there was also a subsequent amendment in 1977. Uh, in the mid-70s, you had uh, uh, catalytic converters required on new new automobiles, and then you had the state of California limiting uh, lead in gasoline. And then in California, the smog check program was implemented in the mid 80s. Uh, a major amendment to the Clean Air Act in 1990, and then in California, they kind of led the way with the 2006 um, <clears throat> Global Warming Solutions Act, or AB 32. So that was a climate change. Uh, program that was initiated in California. So at the federal level, you have the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that's responsible for in implementing and enforcing the Clean Air Act. And I've listed here just a number of the different types of programs that they're responsible for, um, for moving forward. And I'm not going to go through all those in detail, but it's a wide variety of, of of specific new source standards as well as standards for existing sources and then uh, permitting programs. And importantly, uh, they're responsible for establishing the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards or the so-called uh, NACs. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in just a minute. Uh, and here it is. These are the, the current uh, national ambient air quality standards for those different pollutants I talked about earlier. Um, as you can see, they're, 
the, uh, the, the form of the standard is different and it, it's really driven by health studies of what, uh, what the metrics should be to, to determine where we protect sensitive people from exposures and so it really varies uh, across the gamut as you can see. Uh, EPA requires that monitoring be done uh, nationwide and so in, in various in, in the communities they have, there are monitors that will measure the ambient air and it de they will determine whether uh, the individual uh, counties cities meet the standards and if they don't then they have to implement plans to lower pollution to meet those standards and so uh, then that those efforts have to be done at the state and also the local levels and throughout the United States, it's handled differently in each of the states. Some states have just a state program implementing the Clean Air Act. Uh, other states, like California, we have a state entity, which is the California Air Resources Board, but we also have local air pollution control districts, such as my agency, and we're responsible locally for implementing requirements on uh, what are called stationary sources, in other words, everything except the automobile. And so that kind of sets the stage for, uh, for programs like permitting sources, looking at different sources of pollution, where do you need to make the reductions uh, to meet the standards. And so uh, that's what I'm going to go into next, is I'm going to have a series of slides and I'm going to probably, due to time, have to start going fairly quickly through some of this. But I'm going to ha show you uh, some examples of air pollution abatement devices or processes for uh, particulate matter control. There'll be uh, a series for volatile organics, and then there'll be another series for oxides of nitrogen, which we'll cover. So uh, the main uh, devices for particulates are cyclones, bag houses, uh, ESPs are electrostatic precipitators, uh, scrubbers, and particulate filters. And really what you're looking at, it depends on the process, it depends on what type of operation you have. That's how you choose the, the method of control. And so it can start very simply uh, at the very top. If you have a construction project and you're trying to keep dust down, then you can use a water truck. And so that's a fairly simple method. But then as you go down, uh, you see that you have these devices of, of differing uh, complexity. And I'm going to talk about each one of these here in just a minute. So uh, talking about cyclones, these are fairly simple. They're used in um, processes such as um, uh, sawmills, wood processing, um, in the ag industry where you have grain handling and so forth, when you need to control dust from larger particles, there really are no moving parts to these. You just have a fan that pushes the, the air stream into the, the device, and I'll show you how that works here in just a minute. Uh, kind of a takeoff of the cyclone is the multi-clone, and that's just a, uh, a collection of several different smaller uh, cyclones. Uh, this shows you uh, essentially how these devices work. The, the dirty air goes in uh, there in an inlet. It's pushed in and then the material just drops out at the bottom and the clean air comes out at the top. And so you're just relying on, on a centrifugal um, conical a stream developing. Um, and then you see on the right is the, uh, the multi-clone. These devices can also be used in conjunction with other devices like the bag house, which we'll talk about next. So what you have is if you have a, a, a stream, an air stream with a, a wide variety of, of particle sizes, you can have this, these types of devices knock out the larger particles first and then the, like a bag house would take care of the smaller particles. So here's an example of a bag house. And the basic operation here is it's a, it's a fabric filter and the stream comes in, it's, it's a fan will push it in and um, filter out so the clean air comes out the top and then the, the, the dirty air, the particles uh, go out through the bottom. 
Uh, these are very efficient, like 99% efficient in controlling particle pollution. Uh, the drawbacks of the bag house is you can have um, bags break, uh, so you need to make sure you have uh, replacements on hand. If you have a broken bag, it can make a, a pretty bad mess. I, I can tell you that. And then uh, an effective device for uh, controlling very small particles, like from a, a boiler a combustion stream, would be what's called an electrostatic precipitator. And really what that is, is it's, a, it's, it's a, a fairly large unit, which you're seeing here. Uh, you have the, uh, the stream of, of dirty air going through there. An electrical current is, is generated here. It charges the particles, and the particles will be uh, collected on plates before the, uh, the clean air stream then resulting goes out the stack at the top. Uh, you have wrappers that will wrap the plates periodically to drop the, the, soot, the particles that are uh, formed that they're taken out out through the bottom. Uh, this is a, another device. It's, it's called a scrubber, and really what that is is it's it's a way of washing the exhaust stream of pollution. Um, these are also used for odor control in some cases. Uh, here in my county, we don't really see these used that much. In fact, I don't think we have any here at all. The real big downside of a scrubber, a wet scrubber, is it creates another source of pollution, which is dirty water. And that's something that um, we try to avoid as much as possible is by, by cleaning up you know, one source, like an air source, creating another dirty source, in this case water. So. Uh, it's just something that needs to be considered. And then this is what you would see with the wet scrubber. You would see this is steam. This isn't, this isn't pollution. This is steam coming out. And then moving on to diesel particulate filters. These are used for like diesel internal combustion engines. And really what a diesel particulate filter or a DPF is, is a, um, it's simply a um, nothing more than a trap which uh, which soot particles enter but can't exit and this kind of gives you a schematic of, of how it works these things must be regenerated to remove or burn off the particles because they'll stay inside and that regeneration can either take place as part of the operation or you actually have to uh, plug it into something to, to burn them off uh, offline and these units have been used um, recently in new models of uh, diesel trucks, which uh, with varying levels of success, I have to say. I, I think Angela has some stories about that. Uh, for spraying operations, like at an automotive spray paint uh, operation, you know, you can have uh, aerosols from the paint, from the spray, and so they'll have uh, filters, such as you see here. And then um, we have in the case of, of uh, active storage piles of, of gravel or, or some type of, of process such as that, you can have wet control like this where you have a water truck that's being used. Um, also, you can, you can use, uh, in, in cases like for uh, unpaved roads, you can, in addition to using water, you can use what are called surfactants, which will actually um, put a crust in, in and last longer, provide a longer control, then usually you have to run a water truck in a case like this uh, quite often. And here's just some other examples of, this is where they're using uh, spray bars uh, while they're, they're dumping material that'll knock the dust down. So moving on uh, to uh, con control of all to organic compounds, uh, going back to the talking about a, a spray paint operation. Uh, when you're controlling organic emissions, we, we like to see these types of spray guns are called high volume, low pressure um, guns. And so the idea is you, you try to put more paint out with lesser pressure so you have less volatilization 
and you have more of the paint going on the surface. Uh, so just more of that. Here's an example of a spraying operation where they're, they're spraying um, a polyester resin. And then, you know, whenever you're dealing with, with, uh, with these coatings and so forth, you have uh, issues with disposal. And what we like to see is, is folks having all their, uh, their coatings, their solvents and so forth in, in sealed uh, drums as much as possible or sealed cans and just using care and good housekeeping. Uh, as you go forward, and here's some examples where um, you know there's they probably should work a little bit more on their housekeeping. So moving on, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of of devices that are used to control uh, toxic organic compounds. And so here's an example called an, a carbon abs absorber. And so what's happening here is the idea is if you have gas molecules, uh, they're going to stick to a, a, the surface of a solid like an activated, like activated carbon. It's used uh, primarily because it has a strong attraction for organics and a large capacity because it has many pores. Um, compared to other options, it's relatively inexpensive. It, we see it used a lot in, in um, soil and groundwater remediation projects when they're trying to pull contamination out, say if they have a gas, a gas tank that, that leaked over the years and you need to clean the soil up. What they try to do is, is pull the, there are various ways of trying to pull the, the, um, the gasoline contamination out of the soil and then what they can do is pull it in and send, send it through a carbon absorber and it, and it cleans out the materials. And then moving on, we have uh, other examples are uh, uh, thermal oxidizer. And then we have a catalytic oxidizer. And uh, the differences between those, really it's depending on the type of cleanup. Again, this is usually used for uh, environmental cleanup sites. And depends on the concentration of the contaminants you have. So a catalytic uh, device, uh, in essence, you're using catalysts to, to burn at a low temperature. And so it has lower operating temperature and lower fuel usage. We do see a higher capital maintenance cost. You can get catalyst fouling poisoning. For the thermal, uh, you get higher temperatures and higher fuel usage, but lower capital. And there's no catalyst involved. So moving on to um, oxides of nitrogen control. And so, you know, I put the two examples of nox oxides of nitrogen as well as the, the VOCs because, as I mentioned earlier, those are precursors of ozone, which is a, a major problem in, in uh, many parts of California as well as other parts of the nation. So we tend to focus on those. And there's many different types of NOx control measures and technologies that can be used. And it really depends on, on the process, on, on what you're trying to to accomplish with the process. And these are all, NOx is a combustion byproduct. And that's really what, what you're trying to do here is, is either treat the, the air stream or you're trying to make the combustion more efficient and generate less NOx. And, it, and as you see here, there's very, there's several different methods that can be used. Uh, the thing about NOx formation is the higher the temperature of combustion, the more NOx that's generated. That's just, you know, that's just a fact of what happens. So if you can somehow get your combustion occurring at a lower temperature, you can, you can minimize NOx. Uh, but a significant source of NOx emissions are utility boilers such as this. Uh, one method that's used in boilers is what's called stage combustion with overfired air. And it's just what the, the idea just simply is that you is that you introduce the air in various parts of the combustion chamber and you, you uh, provides for a more efficient uh, combustion process with less NOx formation. 
Um, there are also these so-called low NOx burners, um, which use a stage fuel injection, which can make the combustion more efficient. And again, I'm just going to kind of kind of cruise through these um, examples. Some of them are these old, like an ultra low NOx burner uh, can can give you as low as nine ppm or nine parts per million, which is very low. Here's an example of, of, of what's called flue gas recirculation. And, and what you do, it's interesting, is you take the flue gas that's already coming out of the combustion chamber and you recycle it back to the combustion chamber. And so it has a tendency of, of lowering the, the, the temperature of combustion and, and some other things are happening which will reduce NOx. And so you get various levels of reduction depending on, on what you have. And you can see here that, um, that a low NOx burner uh, with no overfire air, that's the, the bar uh, on the left, will give you the, it gives you a pretty good reduction, but not as good as uh, if you have a low NOx burner with overfire air and flue gas recirculation. Another method that's used is with, particularly with, with utility boilers is uh, ammonia injection and so you inject ammonia in and there's various chemical reactions that are occurring which will actually result in, in lower NOx. It, it encourages the formation of, of, of N2 rather than, uh, than the oxides of nitrogen. Uh, the downsides of these is you have to have uh, sources of ammonia like anhydrous ammonia so you've got these big tanks on site and unfortunately there can be issues with what are called ammonia slips where if you don't have these things dialed in just right you can actually have ammonia crystals formed and, and you can get a plume coming out the stack which is not good. And just another picture of the manifold here. And then so uh, for gas fired internal combustion engines you know typically what we see are uh, you need to control oxides of nitrogen. You can have a three-way catalyst, uh, and so this is called a non-selective catalytic reduction, and so it's non-selective because it, it knocks out three, three pollutants. It knocks out not only NOx, but it's carbon uh, monoxide, as well as uh, VOCs. Uh, here's another uh, comparison of different um, NOx control technologies, and it just shows you uh, what they are, what kinds of reductions you expect to see, and so forth. And uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these in details, but you, you can just see that there's a lot of options that are available, and it really just depends on on what kind of equipment you have and what kinds of standards you have to meet. So uh, just a couple more slides left here, and I call this one nearer to home because this is something that you know, we look at what we can do individually to minimize pollution. Uh, the first thing would be, uh, you know, don't burn your garbage. Uh, don't burn it in a burn barrel. Uh, burning your garbage results in uh, various uh, toxins, such as dioxins, believe it or not. And uh, if you burn a lot of garbage like this, you know, you're exposing yourself as well as your neighbors to, to toxins. So try to find other solutions other than, than burning your garbage. Uh, and then related to that, the slide in the bottom is just, uh, you know, burning uh, your, 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 your trimmings and, and so forth from your yard. If you have other solutions or other options, please consider those. Uh, you know, green waste pickup or so forth. Uh, you know, be, be mindful of your neighbors. Um, a lot of people like wood heating. Um, some parts of the country, like in our, our county, uh, wood is cheap and wood heating is a viable option. Uh, but please, if you can, use a, a, a newer a certified uh, wood stove. They're a lot more efficient than the older ones. Uh, the older ones will, will smoke a lot and you'll get exposure not only in your home but also in your neighborhood. If you have the option to go to gas, uh, that would be better or pellet stove. So just something to consider. And and then here's a slide about 
uh, agricultural open burning. We have a lot of orchards here in Butte County, and we and, and, and the the growers have to burn their their orchard prunings. Uh, they like to chip those prunings rather than burn them, uh, and so uh, it can go to a cogeneration facility for, uh, for a biomass cogeneration facility. It's a lot more efficient way of disposing. You can generate electricity as a result. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the biomass cogen facilities in California are closing down, so those options aren't as available. And then here are some examples of some chippers that are used. And I'd like to say uh, that's the end of my part of this. Uh, I want to give credit to the Air Resources Board for the slides that I had here. I drew those uh, from uh, presentations that they've put together. And I'm going to pass this now over to Angela. We're going to pass it to Kevin. We're going to pass it to Kevin. Okay. So, Kevin, if you can stand by. Okay, Kevin, you're on. Okay, thank you, Jim, very much. Uh, it's a delight to be presenting here uh, along with you and the County Air Quality Management District. And uh, we're also very big fans of the Sustainability Management Association. So thank you, Angela. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Cochran, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Green Track. And uh, today we're going to talk about a few case studies that we've performed for the City of Sacramento in a pilot program. But first, a little about Green Track. Uh, we were founded in 2007 in Marysville, about 45 minutes north of Sacramento. We're a cloud-based energy and sustainability management company. Uh, we provide services to cities, to universities, commercial businesses. We track energy consumption, greenhouse gases, projects, uh, everything from electricity, natural gas, fuels, uh, water, sustainability metrics, anything that can be uh, metered or measured or estimated. And we work with a network of energy efficiency partners uh, for energy audits, lighting, heating, uh, solar projects. And we manage engagement and education programs such as the Climate Action Partners Program for cities and utilities and their customers and organizations in their community uh, for energy efficiency programs. And our, our mission really is to accelerate the adoption of energy efficiency programs and technology in the public and private sectors. Now in the fall of 2014, we engaged the city of Sacramento, my hometown, uh, the uh, capital of, of the state of California, city of trees, and soon to be home of the Sacramento Kings in their new Sacramento Arena here, called the Golden One Center, in a pilot program. Uh, and we had two main objectives. One was a fuel and fleet tracking integration, uh, which was tracking their entire fleet of vehicles uh, for their fuel consumption uh, so that this, to allow for the citywide greenhouse gas emissions reporting of actual consumption as well as mixed fleet comparisons. And the second objective was to create a sample portfolio of energy efficiency projects for the city. And so we uh, evaluated three energy efficiency projects, a fleet conversion to natural gas, and then two historical LED lighting projects. So to begin with, uh, we'll talk about the fleet conversion. Uh, the city of Sacramento converted a majority of its garbage trucks to alternative fuels, li liquefied natural gas and CNG, uh, compressed natural gas. Uh, over 100 of its refuse trucks uh, were converted between the, the time period of 2009 to 2013 and resulted in uh, fuel savings over a two-year period of over $800,000 and over uh, 3,000 metric tons of CO2. They also converted 14 of their refuse trucks to uh, CNG, and that, that uh, also re uh, resulted in savings of there you see uh, for the one year, 24,000 and about 100 metric tons of CO2. Now I'm going to show you online in the Green Tracks Energy Manager these uh, savings, but before I do, we'll go ahead and cover the, uh, the two lighting projects, and we'll look at it all at one time. 
So the first lighting project that we uh, evaluated for the city was the downtown Plaza West parking garage. And the city um, upgraded a number of its garages downtown, and we looked at two of them. And this is the first one. And they did a complete retrofit of the downtown Plaza West garage of the lighting system from high intensity discharge lights, HID, to LED fixtures. And they avoided about $300,000 over a five year period and reduced uh, 700 or so metric tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gases. So the total project cost was nearly half a million dollars. They received huge rebates and incentives to do it, but it still cost almost 300000 uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the project is, is a big saver. It saves about $60,000 okay. a year in greenhouse gases. And also, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them on the, um, the chat, uh, and then we'll, we'll cover those in the Q&A time at the end of the, end of the presentation. So the payback was uh, just about five years, but you'll see in a minute when we look at it online, it's uh, really kind of an intuity. It's quite a good project. So the second uh, LED project was done at the Memorial Parking Garage downtown Sacramento. Well, I'm just in the middle of this conversation of trying to work with the And uh, that uh, was performed in 2011, the same uh, conversion from HID to LED. And they avoided a little over 150,000 over a four-year period and almost uh, 400 metric tons over the same period. Project cost, 260,000. Uh, but uh, after incentives and rebates, 140, and the project saved about thousand dollars a year. Uh, I mean, I, I just looked at your email where you said calling, and I were uh, going to be. I have a little bit of chatter on this call. That's what Hello. I was doing. Sorry, email. Sorry, Let's see if I can mute some of. If everyone could please mute themselves, I'm having trouble muting some people. I don't have a okay, there you go, Kevin. I believe okay. so. There's still some chatter in the background. Okay, it's all clear on my end. Uh, you can okay, hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. All right, very good. So this was the second uh, lighting project that was, was done for the City of Sacramento Memorial Garage. And again, uh, that uh, project had a payback of just under four years. So now what I'm going to do is take you to the, uh, the Green Tracks Energy Manager, uh, bypassing, well, first stop here is the Green Tracks homepage. Green Tracks website is uh, greentracks.com. Uh, no C, no carbon in Green Tracks, so green and then tracks. And then if you see at the top right hand side, there's a login screen, a login button in, in each of the, uh, the pages of the website. I've already logged in to the city of Sacramento. And what we see here, uh, actually we don't see what I want to see. We want to go to the dashboard. So this is the, uh, this will be the home page of the uh, city of Sacramento. And what we see in this chart, uh, there's a quadrant of uh, usage trend, cost trend, cost summary, and carbon footprint. And there's other selections that can be made over here. But uh, we're going to focus on those four for the time being. And uh, what we tracked were the last three years, 2013 through 2015. So there's three lines here represented for the total consumption of the entire fleet of vehicles and also the two lighting projects. The two lighting projects are very flat, so the variation will be just uh, related to the fleet itself. And on the axis on the left-hand side, it's measured in mm. BTUs, those are millions of British thermal units, and it's the energy content of uh, fuel or power. So it's a common denominator that we can use uh, to look at uh, look at the uh, various fuels and um, electricity, natural gas. So if you see here, you can see the first six months of the year. Uh, we're going to talk about the fleet mainly. Uh, there was uh, not not too much uh, difference. Uh, but you see a little widening here in the last six months of the year and with more usage in 2015. So you can 
compare that with the actual cost, then you see that uh, 2015, they paid uh, substantially less than the other years, and that was due to a decrease in the price of uh, petroleum fuels, which is gasoline, diesel, and others. And we're going to go right into the carbon footprint. That's what our topic is today, is, is basically greenhouse gas emissions. And again, this is the entire fleet of vehicles plus uh, the two lighting projects. Uh, but uh, it gives you an idea that the city is consuming for its fleet uh, about, or, or generating rather, 18,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases. And uh, down a little bit in 2014 and back uh, in 2015 uh, due to increased usage in, in this year. But also uh, there's some offset compared uh, for the um, fleet conversions that were done. So I'm going to go into now the, the uh, facilities and fleets for the city. And I'm going to click right on the fleet. And we'll, we'll talk about these charts here for a second. You've got uh, the city of Sacramento uh, fleet that's running about $7 million for their fuel consumption in 2013, down to about $5.5 million uh, today. Uh, due, to, due to those decrease in prices. And I'm going to open up the fleet so we can see what we're talking about exactly. Uh, there are light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles. And then there's other vehicles in terms of uh, miscellaneous uh, boats, motorcycles, trailers, etc. Uh, light duty vehicles are the uh, passenger cars, the full trucks, and police cars, SUVs. Medium duty are the uh, ambulance, which I think we have one you might be able to hear going by right now. Um, we have a forklift. <laughs> That's a fire truck. And uh, and here is a fire truck. All right. So right on cue for the the heavy duty vehicles, fire trucks, you've got your dump trucks and your garbage trucks, your front loaders, rear loaders, side loaders, and sweepers. I'll just collapse the medium one, and we'll talk about the light and heavy duty vehicles. So if you go to the energy cost uh, of, of the fleet, you see that uh, gasoline and, and ethanol are light duty vehicle costs. So a little over half of the expense of the fuel is for the light duty vehicles. And diesel fuel at about 21%, and uh, liquefied natural gas at another 20%. So we're going to go right into the fleet and show you the normalized data. It's going to take just a second to, to load here. This is the previous chart that we're looking at now. There we go. Um, so if you're looking at the entire fleet of vehicles, you can see here at the bottom the legend, uh, they power their fleet through a number of commodities, ethanol, liquefied natural gas, gasoline, electric, electricity, propane, diesel fuel, and CNG. And it's all displayed here on this chart. So it takes about 20,000 MMBTUs to power their entire fleet of vehicles. There's uh, 2,400 uh, vehicles or so at the, uh, at the city of Sacramento. And if we go down here at the bottom, I'm just going to hover over the first one, ethanol. You can see that that's a fairly consistent flat over time, and it's a little bit decreasing in 2015. I'm just going to take that one off the, the chart, and we'll look at the next one, LNG. Now, LNG, you have uh, 5,000 MMBTUs. So again, that's about 20% of the city's fleet, 20, 25% of the city's fleet. And uh, the conversion that was done to ref from refuse trucks from diesel to LNG was uh, from diesel fuel. So this used to be all diesel fuel um, prior to 2013. And the benefit of switching to alternative fuels like LNG and CNG is that they're less greenhouse gas emitting about 25 to 30 percent or so. And also, uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, they uh, generally, and this is a little outside of my area, but uh, 
uh, from what I understand, the diesel uh, motors run a little hotter, so they have a higher NOx pollution. So I'm going to take LNG off of the, uh, the chart, and now we'll just look at gasoline. And you can see that's about 10,000 uh, MMBTUs, and, and those are, again, for the passenger cars, police cars, and um, SUVs, and the light-duty vehicles. Now, the interesting thing here is we're looking at diesel fuel in blue, and you can see that it's even being displaced a little bit more here in 2014 and 16 with uh, the red is CNG. So vehicles are being converted uh, to CNG. So I'm going to go right now into the side loader, which there's about 88 uh, vehicles that were converted from diesel fuel to to LNG, and that's what you see here is the uh, the LNG and and the diesel fuel on top. Um, click over the actual data, we can see the actual break breakout of uh, LNG and diesel fuel. So about 90% and 10% for diesel. Let's go back here to normalize, and we'll look at the um, we're going to look at the rear loader vehicles, and then there are 14 rear loader vehicles that were converted from diesel. Uh, in 2014, I'll take uh, the LNG off of the chart because there are some LNG vehicles uh, for front, I mean rear loaders, but uh, you can see that the diesel fuel here is converted completely into CNG and they actually added um, a few more vehicles, that's why it's a little bit higher. And they did a similar thing here with the sweeper trucks, street sweepers and, and other sweepers. I'll just show you the chart. You can see monthly diesel fuel in yellow and monthly uh, CNG in the blue. So the, the city of Sacramento's fleet was uh, ranked as the number one government green fleet in the country in uh, 2013 and continues to be ranked within the top 10 uh, by Green Fleet Magazine and, and others. So they've made some real progressive steps to being, uh, making their fleet green. So now I'm going to turn to the uh, two lighting projects and briefly show you downtown Plaza West. And remember, that was the uh, the big one, about a half a million dollar project that, uh, through incentives, is just over just under three hundred thousand dollar project that uh, returned uh, about fifty five to sixty thousand dollars in energy savings each month. It's going to take just a second for that chart to load. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of data. There we go. So you can see um, it's also an MMBTU. So 300 MMBTUs down to just over 100, 150. So they cut it uh, in half. This is the date of the project in November 2011. Um, I can actually pull this chart back. We've got data all the way back to oh 2000 and. Uh, about 2,000. Whoops, there we go. So, but you get the idea. So just imagine all of this uh, energy consumption here has been knocked off, and it, and it really creates an annuity of savings going forward. Now we'll look at the savings right now. And this is cost avoidance. So this is avoidance of, uh, of cost here in the $50,000 to $60,000 range. And that's different than. Um, than just uh, cost savings. Cost avoidance calculates what you would have spent had you not done the, the conversion or the uh, project. So we're going to look at the um, normalized data again, and we're going to look at the memorial garage. And I'm just at the end of my time as well, but we'll see a similar savings here as far as um, a lot of data being loaded in the background uh, for the Memorial Garage. And it's still loading. Uh, this one saved uh, approximately $40,000 per month. And there it is. OK. So you can see uh, a similar chart. Uh, there's green here, and that represents natural gas. I'm just going to take that off of the uh, chart because this is a lighting 
project that we looked at. And again, if I pull this back, you can see that there's heavy consumption all through the uh, 2002 period. And by doing this lighting project, you really knock off a, a large uh, part of, of the energy consumption. And then the, the cost avoidance here in the $35,000 to $40,000 range. So that, uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation here. And that really concludes this is Memorial Garage and it shows the, the payback and the return on investment was about 200% uh, uh, payback in uh, under four years. So uh, thank you very much. This is uh, some of the Green Tracks team. We're at, actually at the Golden One Center. Um, so we're here, here to take your questions now. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Angela. Thanks for that great presentation to both our speakers, to both Kevin from Green Tracks and Jim from Butte County Air Quality Management District. And um, I really liked how you could roll back that report to look at almost an entire decade of usage uh, to be able to see that project um, that is going to, um, how much that project is going to save them money and also reduce their greenhouse gases over time. And you know, that ROI was pretty exciting. That was under three years as well, you know. Um, so thank you for that. If uh, you're in our audience, if you could please uh, type in or go ahead and turn on your telephone or your speakers and microphones. And uh, please feel free to ask any questions or to type them into the chat box. And I had a few questions uh, for Jim. Um, and so basically, I was just really excited about all of the technologies that are existing today um, and the investment that's going in into pollution abatement, um, especially as we look at new technologies for energy uh, production. And the, I had a question where I just typed in for you um, that for manufacturers, what is the what is the best technology for NOx that you would recommend? Um, well, you know, you really well, talked about all right. Well, it, it depends on what kind of manufacturing you're doing, and you're really you're you're talking about what kind of fuels you're burning. So, if you have a process where you you have a boiler uh, or something like that. Uh, you should be looking at your fuel and go to cleaner fuels such as natural gas. Um, in California, that's pretty much what everybody uses uh, for boiler fuels is natural gas, and we've gotten a lot of reductions because of that. And then you look at some of those uh, low NOx burners that are available would be one way. And I think you get reductions not only of, of NOx but also CO2. And then for utility, uh, the question, what about utility boilers? Again, you know, what's happened in California is we've gone pretty much away from fuel oil and boilers and just to natural gas. Uh, and so uh, you get you get a cleaner burn uh, with less uh, pollution, less toxics. Uh, then the other question you had here is... Um, what is it? Do you know how... Cities worked with businesses for water discharge, and that's something that my agency really doesn't get too involved in. But I know here locally that there's a lot of communication between the businesses and uh, and the city cities as far as as their waste streams and what kinds of treatments might be necessary for uh, water discharges. Right. Thank, right. Thank you. That helps a lot because if you were thinking about doing uh, one of the, was it the spray booth, um, the utility boiler, I was just thinking that you'd have that discharge of water and that extent to right. do discharge from the right. water. Right. Right. So, so your agency, so your agency would, really would really mostly focus on the air side and then another agency would work on the waste management. Right. Gotcha. And then Kevin, and then Kevin our, um, for the city of Sacramento, are, are, are they in their first tier of goals, or are, are they working towards uh, new lighting and fleet management projects, or 
would you happen to know? Because it looks like they've made some real gains and that are very exciting and hopefully motivating to uh, the employees and the, the citizens of the city of Sacramento. That's right. Well, they uh, just completed and will be releasing soon their updated uh, greenhouse gas inventory, um, which is done on a, oh, geez, uh, it's sort of a, a five-year to seven-year time horizon, and uh, it takes a lot to, to get all of that information together. And that was one of the goals of this project was to provide more recurring uh, updates, really uh, to be able to, to manage your greenhouse gases with some, um, you know, some level of uh, action that you can put behind them on a, on a monthly or annual basis. And, uh, and they, as far as the lighting projects, there was a big, um, they were able to take advantage of some of the uh, government funding and incentives, and that was the impetus between those lighting projects with the garages. Um, they have uh, ongoing fleet, um, uh, you know, conversions that they're doing to compress natural gas, uh, but uh, kind of nothing on the order of the, of the big uh, liquefied natural gas conversion, other than uh, if, I, if I didn't say that they are, now that they've switched to LNG, they are buying 100% renewable uh, non-petroleum natural gas, uh, which, which is an additional, uh, you know, about half of the greenhouse gases are reduced from LNG by buying 100% right. renewable. Right. Amazing. And it's really nice that the richness of those reports to be able to really hone in on, you know, what are the largest users, um, so you could prioritize those projects. And so I really um, am pretty amazed at what they've been able to achieve, and it's really great to be able to explain it all. I'm just looking at the numbers, you know, and the, at the outcome of their project. So I thank you both so much for your time. If there aren't any additional questions, um, I really appreciate you joining the call today. And we look forward to you joining us next month for our next topic, which will be on solid waste management and conducting waste audits to identify how you could uh, improve your waste stream. And thank you again to both of our speakers. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Kevin. Thank you.